Well, hello and welcome. This is video six in an eight-part series on the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment. Uh, this will be the, the first of three videos where we're going to take a look at the Enlightenment specifically. Uh, in today's video, we're going to talk about what the Enlightenment uh, was and talk about two influential figures, English figures, uh, that really helped spur on what we know of as the Enlightenment. So here we go. All right, so as far as talking about what the Enlightenment was or is, uh, if we want to look at a definition, I guess you could say for it, I've got this on the screen up here, a, a social movement that sought to apply uh, the principles of science and how the natural world was being understood to society. Uh, so in a lot of ways, uh, it was taking how uh, scientific thinking, objective thinking, uh, was working to help us understand the natural world better, uh, also with the hopes to improve our place in it. Uh, with the Enlightenment, it was basically the social aspect of that. Uh, so trying to use more of an objective approach, more of a scientific approach to understanding society with the goal, ultimately, of improving society. Now, what I want to focus on uh, with the rest of the time in this video today are two people uh, that were uh, influential thinkers uh, from England towards these ideas that we tend to think about uh, regarding Enlightenment thought. And uh, what we're going to see with these two figures is very different perspectives. Uh, to a certain degree, uh, the first figure will, will be a little more representative of probably what you might call the older approach, and then the second person will be more of the newer Enlightenment approach. Now, to a certain degree, they, they had similar experiences. Uh, they were living um, more or less during similar times, certainly were alive during some significant times in England, uh, yet they ended up coming away with a very different take on what was best for society. So we'll start first with Thomas Hobbes, and we'll look at his ideas. Uh, one thing about Hobbes, he was uh, very much shaped by the events of the English Civil War. Uh, that had a lot to do with his perspective. And if you think back to what we talked about a couple videos ago with the English Civil War, uh, it was a, a tough set of circumstances. Uh, one type of government uh, was in place before it. Another type of government was in place after it. Uh, there was a lot of chaoticness, certainly during the fighting and a certain degree of chaos even before. Um, and then there was, you know, a degree of unpleasantness after. Uh, there was a lot going on uh, and a lot of it wasn't very good. Uh, so when you start looking at his perspective, it's probably not surprising that a person might arrive at this conclusion. Uh, first of all, just when it came to his view on people, uh, he believed that people were naturally selfish and wicked, uh, that they were basically only interested in their own good and would uh, stop at nothing to, to have what worked well for them, uh, even at the expense of other people. Uh, so in terms of, you know, would people do the right thing if given the opportunity? He'd probably say, probably not, not unless they thought that was what was going to be good for them. And so how that shaped his view on what made sense for government is that he thought uh, that unless there was some kind of a strong government in place to basically tell everybody what to do and make people do what needed to be done, uh, people would end up living a very horrible life, uh, that, that it would be dangerous, uh, that, that you could probably never rest, you could never relax, uh, because uh, if you had anything worth having, somebody was going to probably try to take it from you. If you needed something that somebody else had, you were probably going to try to take it from them. Uh, that the opportunity for death and violence and nastiness would be would be intense if if people were left to themselves. And so what he saw as the best kind of system was one where uh, people, in essence, or at least as he put it, uh, gave up their rights to an absolute ruler um, in exchange for law and order. Now, he referred to this as making a social contract um, whereby you give up your individuality, you give up your individual freedom. Uh, you let this one person who's chosen to be this absolute ruler uh, make the decisions on everybody's behalf, and that would be a society uh, that you would be able to live in, uh, survive in, thrive in, be safe in. Um, now, depending on how you feel about that, obviously, uh, you're uh, making some assumptions. Uh, you're, you're certainly assuming that the person you give this power to is going to make uh, decisions on your behalf that are for your good. Uh, but basically, he distrusted people enough uh, that he didn't think leaving it to chance 
uh, had any chance of success and that this was the only way uh, for society to be able to function. Give that individual, give, give everybody give up their individual power uh, to this absolute ruler. And that in his mind, uh, absolute monarchy was the only way uh, to really have order and stability in a society. And again, I want to emphasize that he was uh, writing during a, a time when uh, the English Civil War had just concluded and, and, and he had experienced uh, the turmoil of, of the kind of fighting you get uh, with a Civil War situation, which is, you know, fellow countrymen fighting against fellow countrymen. And, and, and so it would certainly make sense that, uh, that he might have a, a negative view on people's ability to work things out at that particular moment in time. The other person to talk a little bit about now is a person named John Locke, uh, who had a very different perspective on uh, what government could be, how people could fit into it, uh, whether or not people could govern themselves. And his views uh, would end up becoming a, a big part of the movement towards the Enlightenment, uh, because whereas Hobbes had a very negative outlook on people and, and negative expectations about what people could do, uh, Locke was really very much the opposite. Uh, he was very optimistic about uh, what people could do if given the opportunity to make their own choices. Uh, so first of all, uh, he simply believed that people were capable of governing themselves. Uh, so he was a strong advocate uh, for what we generally refer to today as self-government. Uh, a lot of times uh, you hear people use terms like democracy uh, to, to describe the kind of uh, government situation where people have a voice or people have a say in, in how things are done. Now, whether it's true democracy, whether it's more of a republic, there's a lot of different types or versions of self-government. But uh, at the end of the day, what Locke believed was uh, if people were given an opportunity to manage themselves or govern themselves, that they could do so successfully. Uh, some other things that he said that are very much a part of our, our country, our American country's founding and, and really kind of cultural components uh, of our country uh, come from uh, some beliefs that go back to Locke. Uh, he talked about natural rights. And when he talked about natural rights or tried to identify what those were, uh, he was talking about life, liberty, and property, uh, that, that everybody is, is in essence born free and equal, and, and that there are just certain things by being a human being that, that you have uh, that are yours and, and are to be guaranteed. And that when it comes to government, uh, the simple purpose of government, not, I guess it's not necessarily easy to protect these things, but but the essence of government is to protect those rights, uh, really nothing more, nothing less. Uh, so, so, you know, government is there to make sure that, you know, your ability to stay alive uh, goes intact, that people don't, aren't able just to freely take your life from you or, 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 or imprison you for, for no reason. Or, or if you have property, whether it's a, a vehicle or a home or, or an iPhone or whatever it is, that it's not okay for people just to take those things and that you have government uh, there to try to establish a system whereby uh, those types of things are, are protected for you, that you're safe and free and protected in those ways. And of course, if you look at or think about documents, founding documents uh, with our country, like the Declaration of Independence, uh, you see language in there, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is the way it is mentioned in the uh, Declaration. Um, that, that comes really straight from Locke. And something else that's also in the Declaration of Independence uh, that came from Locke was, you know, if a government's not doing what it's supposed to do, it's actually the, the uh, responsibility and, and the right of the people to change it, to alter it, uh, to get rid of it if they need to. And, and that's very much a part of our Declaration. Uh, so we definitely uh, have a pretty strong connection, if you go back to the founding of our country, uh, with Locke and his ideas. And, and a big part of the founding of our country, as it relates to the ideas, did come from um, Enlightenment ideas. Uh, so that should not be uh, surprising. Uh, so what we'll be looking at then in the remaining couple of videos uh, here on the Enlightenment is just to talk about uh, more on the ideas and other influential people with Enlightenment thought. And then finally, to, to talk about the overall impact, because to a certain degree, uh, the Enlightenment is something that is still with us today. Uh, you know, when we think about the founding of our country and, and some of the words out of documents like the Declaration of Independence, you know, those were written a long time ago and, and they really established a goal uh, for our country. And it's probably safe to say that if you look at the all the words that are in that declaration, uh, we maybe haven't achieved everything that that is laid out there just yet. 
uh, but we're getting closer and closer all the time. And, and that's in a lot of ways kind of what Enlightenment ideas are all about, uh, setting a, some, some goals and ideals uh, for how things can be and, and working towards those. Uh, hope you found this video helpful and informative. Thanks for watching.